sure that uh, Sarah has a chance to get to bed. She's joining us from Australia. <laughs> Narendra is joining us from South Africa and Maha from Egypt. And as you can see from the map, we've got a number of people from all over the world, and some of them even from my home state in the U.S. Uh, so in starting, I just want to welcome everyone to this session, which is the journey uh, to social justice and openness and open and distance uh, in e-learning. I'm very excited about this session. We've got a fabulous group of speakers who will be presenting today. Um, and so I would like to start with Narend um, Bejnath, who is going to be um, <clears throat> talking about social justice and open universities. Narend is CEO of the Council of Higher Education in South Africa. And prior to this, he was Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of South Africa. As PVC at UNISA, University of South Africa, he drove the digitalization and OER strategies of the university. Narendt holds a master's degree from Durham University and a doctorate from the University of the Western Cape. Narendt has extensive experience in ODO, higher education policy, ICT, ICTs in higher education, business intelligence, planning, and quality insurance. He serves on the Commonwealth of Learning Board and is currently audit committee chairperson, chairperson as well as deputy chair of the board. He's a member of the Academy of Science of South Africa, and in 2008 he was appointed a fellow at St. Edmunds College, Cambridge University, and simultaneously a research professor at OU UK. Narendra, I'm going to hand the floor over to you so you can start with your presentation. Thank you very much, Lisa, and uh, hello everyone, and uh, Special hello to the uh, co-presenters, and I want to uh, just say what a pleasure it is to be part of this panel and also of this conversation, uh, and I'm so pleased that so many have signed up for it. Uh, a special thanks to Lisa for initiating this project and for bringing us all together. It's fantastic. Now, my vantage point is, uh, that of policy uh, planning and uh, regulation at the systems level in South Africa. And uh, as uh, Lisa has pointed out, I've also had quite extensive experience in higher education leadership and management. Uh, and this is at the largest uh, university on the continent, I think, UNISA, uh, which has currently in the region of about 400,000 students. It's the largest uh, institution in the country. Uh, among 26 publicly funded institutions. So the challenges of the Global South, uh, which are integral uh, to the social justice imperative, uh, are those of poverty and underdevelopment, uh, small and underdeveloped economies, uh, legacies of colonialism, uh, which post-colonial governments in uh, most, instances, uh, most instances have not been able to shake off um, and they find expression or, or, or manifest in underdevelopment, uh, backlogs in infrastructure, uh, general social inequality and uh, inequality in access to opportunity, uh, quite pervasive poverty uh, and limited uh, opportunities uh, overall. And this is in spite of several decades uh, of uh, self-determination. So understandably then the, the logic behind uh, development policy in many uh, contexts rests on the premise that if opportunities for post-school education and training are increased and expanded and participation is widened, that the results will be positive and that uh, they will manifest in enhanced skills, uh, deeper democratic participation, the accumulation of cultural capital, increased economic activity, and greater prosperity all around, uh, and thereby uh, achieving a greater social justice. So that's the, the logic behind this. Now, I want to look a little at what the seduction behind uh, ODL is a little more closely. So the expansion of uh, post-school education and training systems is integral to development policy, generally in the global south, uh, for the reasons that I've just espoused. 
So ODA promises to overcome several developmental hurdles. Uh, firstly, that universities and other post-school education and training institutions are very expensive to set up and to sustain. So it is understandable that open distance learning has been very attractive as a policy option, promising increased access at low unit costs. The second is that in large countries in the global south, populations are generally dispersed over quite big uh, geographical distances, often rural, with very little infrastructure. So the attraction of open distance learning to reach students where they are, uh, where they are without imposing a huge cost burden on the state and costs to uh, uh, often poor citizens. The third is that um, the, or rather the trouble is that the lower the uh, resource base of the state, often the more rudimentary the technologies that are available, the infrastructure, as well as learning resources. And uh, other consequences of large numbers with low unit of resource is that there are fewer assessment opportunities, uh, little mediation of learning, little interaction uh, with other learners, and even with the institution. So generally, the quality of learning and ultimately the learning outcomes are deeply affected. And uh, finally, these are all exacerbated by poor school experiences, uh, where there's little cultural capital, which is the tact of knowledge, which is generally taken for granted uh, for successful university study. Now, while we, uh, sorry, while the use of uh, emerging and new technologies have progressed in the developed world, there is often an enormous lag in the global south due to uh, just an absence of resourcing or limited capital uh, infrastructure backlogs generally because of the uh, difference between the need and the available resources to meet those. Uh, there are capacity issues as well. Uh, there's predatory and often collusive uh, pricing of services that is a corollary of uh, government in, in most of the developing world. Uh, and lots of corruption, uh, so that causes a lot, a loss of public resources through corruption. And we see it; it's, it's a pervasive problem on the continent, and it's a particularly big problem in South Africa, which we are trying to deal with at the level of uh, at the state level. So, while technology is an enabler, it can also be an alienator. So, one of the major losses through open distance learning is having the society of other learners learning with and from each other, and of course the motivation that comes from peer pressure in the learning process. And the digital era, uh, of course, has ameliorated many of the limitations of older technologies, but uh, there are still huge accessibility, infrastructure, and affor affordability barriers. Now, I shift a little to the context where, social just where the social justice imperative is strong. Uh, and this is often accompanied by material and other conditions, which can be further barriers. So the zeal with which uh, the promise of open distance learning has been taken up often glosses over the very real shortcomings and the barriers to success. And first among these is that uh, those from the margins of society who are often poor, have low cultural capital, uh, have experienced poor schooling, are technology poor, uh, have little or costly access to the internet, uh, often accompanied by studying through a medium which is a second or third language uh, medium uh, in the university, uh, generally have a greater need for learning support and mediation rather than less. And paradoxically, uh, they are required to undertake more uh, self-managed learning and independent learning which uh, even students you know, coming from a quite solidly middle-class background struggle uh, to perform in, in contact institutions. So that's Achilles heel, I think, of open distance learning, is that without the contact or with reduced contact, uh, and in the global south, not having made strides 
in harnessing technology to create virtual learning environments, which are the vehicle for learning support, uh, accompanied by a diverse range of resources to support learning and cater for individual needs. Uh, so that's a big hill for us to climb. Um, Lisa, warn me when I've got two minutes left, please. This uh, scenario that I've just sketched then is uh, well illustrated in the South African context. Uh, so one third of the publicly funded cohort, uh, which I've mentioned earlier, and this accounts for just under 400,000 students, are enrolled in our uh, dedicated distance learning institution. And the recruits are generally the poor and the, the working class, uh, those in rural areas. So generally the marginalized in society, uh, generally those who've come through really poor schooling and generally in need of the most learning support but receiving the least. And of course, uh, political issues uh, related to access to resources and access to funding uh, are persistent issues and they've uh, been destabilizing our institutions uh, at least since 2015. And even though uh, that has the challenge has been ameliorated, but it remains a constant threat and disrupts the academic program, uh, you know, creating an even bigger problem. So you've got students come with low knowledge base and with limited cultural capital, uh, also then disrupting their learning, so ending up with even less uh, accumulated learning capital to enable their success in later years. So it just compounds the problem. And then what it uh, manifests in is low uh, throughput rates and uh, huge dropout rates, low uh, pass rates. And that's pervasive in the system, but particularly for the open distance learning provision. Now, it is clear that we must be more critical of the assumptions and premises on which we advocate open distance learning as a solution, especially in the global south. I know it's not of too much interest and concern perhaps for Europe, but uh, the global south makes up well over 3 billion of the world's population. Uh, so uh, any failure uh, is going to have an impact worldwide and the world economy and movement of people and so on. So I do believe it is everyone's challenge and everyone's problem to deal with. At the heart of it is that without the uh, required investments in infrastructure, capacity development, and learning resource development, or the sharing of all of these, we may as well be, uh, may well be raising false hope at best, or at worst, uh, producing legions of graduates who are not properly equipped for the 21st century world of work, for the dig uh, digital age, for entrepreneurship, and for leading fulfilled lives, because that's one of the key outcomes from higher education as well. Um, so in the Global South, the, the rhetoric that drives the social justice agenda is that if we provide more education, there will be greater social justice. And my argument is that that is a sim simplistic equation. So it doesn't necessarily, necessarily flow uh, in this progressive logic uh, that with more participation, there will be more skilled and successful graduates uh, equipped for success and productive work, therefore more prosperity leading to greater social justice. Uh, because that's, if you follow the logic and deconstruct it, that's what it uh, uh, can be distilled into. Um, what I'm arguing is that we must look at the enabling conditions uh, for success in open distance learning. And in developing contexts in particular, much of the populace still has to benefit from basic technology related to water, sanitation, housing, and, and electrification, for example. And that's certainly so in our context in, in South Africa. Food security is a big problem, as is uh, nutritional diets infrastructure backlogs or unevenness of provision uh, pose huge barriers to access uh, to low-cost digital technology infrastructure. Uh, and the resources available to the state uh, are either limited or being looted or being uh, competed for by other 
social development priorities. So these are quite intractable problems in social theory. So the recent discourse on uh, the forces of change that affect uh, national development prospects, uh, universities and uh, business more generally, is that of the fourth industrial revolution. So some of the discourse is at the policy level. So what changes in the economy, uh, need for skills, uh, and capacities, opportunities for business and uh, employment. That, does the state need to develop and implement policy for is a big question. For universities, the big questions are what does the fourth industrial revolution uh, presage for the future world of work and for the kind of kinds of uh, qualifications and skills required for the workplace of the future. A related question is what kinds of employment are on the way out and what new ones are emerging or are still anticipated to emerge in the future that universities need to make uh, planning decisions about now so that when the, when they, when the need arises that the, the provision is already there. And the general question is what will this all signify for those caught up in old technologies who have not yet benefited from the first and second uh, industrial revolutions, let alone the third. Uh, uh, and let's not even talk about the fourth because there's so much to catch up on in the global south. Uh, so many people are captive to uh, really ancient technologies, first uh, industrial revolution related technology. Uh, that the hill to climb is quite uh, steep. Uh, in order to achieve social justice. So let me conclude then with uh, a few other observations or actually related to the overall argument. The first is that open distance learning providers in the context of the fourth industrial revolution have greater challenges to pursue social justice. And that's really the point we just made. Growing, uh, with growing populations and declining employment opportunities for the for the lower skilled. Uh, so that's a particular structural problem in most of our contexts, that large numbers of the workforce are low skilled or semi skilled or unskilled. Uh, so let's not even begin to uh, contemplate what it will take uh, to bring all of them up to speed uh, to benefit from the fourth industrial revolution. The second is that attention also needs to be paid to the likelihood that vast numbers of highly and complexly skilled graduates for the industrial, fourth industrial revolution can be produced in time to gain a competitive advantage. This is a constant divide between the developed world and the global south. Uh, and we're constantly in the global south playing catch up uh, and never quite getting there. Because as soon as we get to a point where we think we're caught up, the uh, frontiers have, of development in the science, in uh, technology, and so on, have moved way beyond. So it's constantly out of reach. The third is that I um, can't understand my writing now. For the uh, for the global south, the key imperative is to look critically at what the barriers to success are, and make the necessary investments in infrastructure, capacity, uh, development of learning resources, harvesting what is freely available as OERs and ameliorating the systemic inefficiencies among others so that all of so that we push things across a very wide front the fourth is that quality assurance is a very powerful tool to bring institutional systems processes modes of delivery and all facets of programs the sharp scrutiny so that uh, the required improvements may be effected the fifth is that we must appreciate and low cost can mean cheap and ultimately valueless uh, post-school education and change. And we must guard against that. And then the very final point is that the pursuit of social justice, uh, done with all good intentions, must not be allowed to result in swelling the ranks of the unemployed, the underemployed, and the unemployable. Thanks. Indeed.
Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Nan, for your um, really insightful presentation. We've had quite a bit of activity in the chat, uh, and uh, I'd like to ask you some of the questions that have popped up there. Uh, first question is from Anna Christina, um, who was in a conversation with Maha, but I thought you might want to address this uh, question as well. Uh, with the stress on paper qualifications and rejection of online qualifications in countries, and here I'm assuming she means uh, in the South or that, uh, um, you know, are challenged by social justice, uh, which actually do have e-learning, how can this be changed uh, that we don't stress as much on, on paper qualifications, rejection of online qualifications? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't fully grasp the question. Uh, I need you to repeat it. Okay. Um, Anna up. Christina has clarified it further. Uh, the, there is a paper qualifications, the rejection of online quali qualifications is being rejected in the global south in general. Um, how do we change this? So the paper qualifications are being rejected. Okay. Uh, I think are you saying? Or online? I think paper qualifications, Anna Christina, maybe you want to clarify I think, that. I think um, and means, Naran, you could just. I think she means that if you get an online degree in some global south countries like Arab countries, these are not acceptable degrees. They're not considered equivalent to a face to face. Yeah, I think that, that that is largely a matter of perception, and it's also the lag in. Uh, you know, the, the cultural change that is taking place and has probably also t uh, already taken place in the developed world, but it's only a matter of time before that changes. Like in the South African context, for example, um, five or ten years ago, it would be unthinkable that people would do uh, a undertake a qualification online. Um, and now I think that it's quite acceptable and the conversations that are uh, happening at the moment are about how can you uh, select options from various uh, different jurisdictions, uh, different uh, possibilities for learning, and craft that into a degree program. And even at the regulate, regulatory level where I work, we are having the force to give attention to that, uh, making it possible for joint degrees and for uh, you know fragments or elements of degrees uh, taken from different institutions all over the world uh, and crafting together a degree program. A lot of uh, training uh, for the workplace is now done online and that's becoming increasingly acceptable. Even as recently as five, and, five to ten years ago, uh, that would be in a very difficult and uh, uh, difficult uh, project to sell uh, to the public. So it's Remember, it's, it's about how much of the population has been uh, immersed in digital technology from the time that they have been born or, or grown up. Now, we have a whole generation of uh, youth who are coming into our institutions who have known nothing else but digital technology and, you know, with all the, the abundance of resources that come with it. So that, that has changed. I mean, the student demographics have changed that dramatically. So I, I do believe that, that, and that's for all contexts, uh, no matter what they are, uh, that it's only a matter of time before they catch up because you can't stop or slow down the spread of technology. It's just that it's taking longer to get to some areas because of all kinds of barriers, some of which I've mentioned. Um, now, and the next question is from Jeanette, and then we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, her question is, uh, or her comment, many ODL students need nurturing to accommodate or overcome their legacy deficits. How can we harness technology to that end? Uh, this applies to any community that has the deficits being discussed. You faded out a bit towards the end. Um, uh, can you can you please repeat that again? I uh, didn't fully grasp sure. the question. Sure. The question is from Jeanette, who said many OD many yes. ODL students need nurturing uh, to accommodate or overcome their legacy deficits. How can we harness technology to that end to help them overcome their legacy deficits? Okay. I've got you now. I've got you. Thank you. 
So I think, you know, the great promise of technology for that um, is to cater for individual needs. So you may have someone who's struggling with the foundational knowledge and the discipline whose needs are quite different to someone who's struggling with, um, say, academic literacy or numeracy, uh, who's struggling with some concepts, for example. Um, so the, the beauty of uh, the technological possibilities that we have now is that you can have a whole compendium of uh, learning opportunities uh, catering for perhaps the most common needs and build that over time. So you can build online resources and uh, learning experiences for students that cater for all of these. Because otherwise, if you rely only on the speaking teacher, uh, you have to make assumptions about what the needs of the students are. And so you're not catering for the individual needs. So students can then select from a menu of possibilities, Jeanette, and uh, then, you know, uh, or they can be directed to the menu of uh, uh, learning opportunities uh, and you keep building that catalog uh, so that anyone having any need ultimately uh, will have that need addressed and that's really the great uh, potential and possibility for uh, of technology which I don't think in our I just wanted to add that I think it, it also gives us a great it. opportunity to link learners to mentors so I think it for me I think um, uh, the, the social learning that um, is so important for people to, to, to be able to connect with others to unpack what's happening and talk it through. I think there's just a, a lot of potential in the, the social learning, even if it's, um, you know, mobile phone connection or just simple connections. But um, um, I think the, um, the sort of bringing in of, of study groups and regional groups, um, sometimes you can form those actual face-to-face -face support groups around a common technology core and I think for me and the research that I'll talk about later I'm particularly excited about the way in which the technology actually is enabling those sorts of social supports and um, community-based opportunities as well and, and that can also encourage localization of different indigenous languages and um, local languages to help unpack um, materials that might be uh, as we often have, you know, bilingual learners. So, um, yeah, I think that those are, are really good moves as well. Absolutely, agreed. Thank you, Sarah and Narend. I'd now like to move on to our next speaker today, who is Maha Bali, who is um, an Associate Professor of Practice at the Center for Learning and Teaching at the American University in Cairo. She'll be talking to us today about intentions and realities of social justice in open educational practice and giving us some examples um, to think about. Maha, um, I'm going to jump here to her biography, um, is a co-founder of virtuallyconnecting.org and co-facilitator of Equity Unbound. Uh, and she has interviewed on the Leaders and Legend, Legends of Online Learning podcast and was featured alongside 15 amazing women of the Open Movement in the Uncommon Women 2018 Coloring Book. She is an editor of Hybrid uh, Pedagogy Journal and editorial board member of Teaching and Higher Education Online Learning Journal, Journal of Pedagogic Development, Learning Media and Technology, and International Journal of Education Technology and Higher Education. She is a learnaholic, writeaholic, and passionate op open and connected educator who tweets a lot. Uh, you can follow her at at Bali uh, underscore Maha, and she also blogs a lot, and I can highly recommend her blog, which you can find at blog.mahabali.me. I will enter that into the chat so that uh, for those of you that are interested, you can follow her. Thank you Go so ahead, much, Maha. Lisa. Thank you for uh, thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you for this uh, introduction. Thank you for organizing this panel. And a lot of respect for bringing all Global South people on this panel. That's, uh, that's an amazing feat. And thank you so much, Naren, for the, now I have to follow you. And you've already been talking about a lot about the history of the kinds of intentions of social justice that don't always make it. Um, and obviously, Naren, you've been working in the field within the institution. I'm going to be talking about open educational practices, which a lot of times happen outside of or adjacent to institutions. 
uh, but often claim to have social justice um, intentions. Uh, and then the, the realities may be slightly different. And I have a sort of expansive view of what I mean by open educational practices. Um, first of all, I just want you all to know that my slides are open for commenting. So if after this session you want to post comments on particular slides, you can do that. The link is this bit.ly slash edlw maha all caps. Um, so I'm just going to copy that maybe onto the chat as well. Oh, it's kind of difficult to copy. Anyway, if someone wants to copy that. Okay. So first of all, I, I want to engage the audience a little bit with this slide, which I, I use quite a lot. If you've seen me present, you might have seen it before. What do you see when you look at this? If you just type that into the chat. Butterfly. <laughs> well, I meant what do you see in the writing? So potential. What does the text say? Diversity. Okay. That is an interesting response because people usually just respond to what they're reading. Yeah. So opportunity is now here. Is anybody feeling different? Or else like <laughs> Okay. Need to seek opportunity, mm -hmm. demand it. Or opportunity is nowhere. Right, and, and I think with a lot of uh, educational innovation uh, and with a lot of things like social justice orientation of educational innovation, sometimes something will look like, oh my God, opportunity is now here, let's use it. And sometimes it will look like opportunity is nowhere, there's no point in going down this road, this is a waste of everyone's time. And I think a lot of times the same thing, the same intervention might look for one group of people as having a lot of positive potential and for another group of people as being dangerous. Just yesterday in the session about AI in higher education, uh, I think the facilitator, the moderator asked people to say one word about it, and someone said potential, and the other person said dangerous, you know? It's the same thing, and it might have different impacts on different people, and also depending on your viewpoint, which I think is important to, to consider when analyzing any, um, any, anything that we talk about here. So I'm going to try to sort of do that and bring in these different viewpoints about the same thing and look at the same thing from different perspectives. Um, I'm, I'm glad you guys like the colors. I like the colors too. That's why I use this slide a lot. <laughs> and uh, my work in general uh, on social justice and decoloniality is influenced by these people. Some of them are people who work with me directly. Actually, all of them are people I work with directly as well. But um, because each one of these papers, which are linked in the slides, um, goes about trying to apply these, these concepts in practice. It's very easy to read about decoloniality, decolonization, and social justice, but to try to apply them and to say, how would this work if we tried to do it, this is not so easy. Um, I, I'm sure Sarah will talk a little bit more about Nancy Fraser's model of social justice. The idea of it is that social justice often is talked about as only economic or only cultural. Nancy Fraser looks at cultural, economic, and political. So a lot of times when we talk about you don't have access to the technology because you don't have the infrastructure, that's mostly an economic issue of maldistribution. That's the injustice going on there. But sometimes we're talking about, oh, this content doesn't exist in my native language, or this content does not tell the story of my culture. And that's a cultural misrecognition. So that's the injustice happening there. And then the third way that uh, an educational situation might have a problem is political. Who are the people who are making the decisions about which um, educational material gets funded, which educational intervention gets funded, who's on the table, what kind of power do minorities have to influence decisions made. So those are three dimensions to look at a lot of things. And to remember when we're talking about social justice that maybe one of them gets addressed, but the others may not. And so the other thing to consider, which again comes from Nancy Fraser's work, but also Andriotti's, is that when we come to address issues of social justice, we may not be addressing the root causes of the injustice. We might be making small affirmative or ameliorative changes that sort of fix the immediate access problem, for example, but not a transformative solution. So this would be kind of like maybe instead of um, improving infrastructure in the country as a whole, providing devices to individuals, but not solving the infrastructure inequality. Uh, something that's more transformative would then have a, a larger impact and addresses the root of the injustice. But the other thing to keep in mind, and as someone from a country that receives a lot of foreign funding for our, um, for our education and other kinds of reform, 
is that the reform can produce negative effects or can be quite neutral for certain groups of people. So it might work for one group of people but be negative for another group. That's also important. And so it's, context is so important here when talking about this. The other thing to, to keep in mind, and I don't need to talk maybe too much about this, but the fact that coloniality, you know, continues even after colonialism has officially ended. Now there's neocolonialism, which we can talk about later, but the idea is the impacts of colonial, colonialism still continue in, in countries that are post-colonial right now. Um, and that, you know, people from colonized, previously colonized countries still internalize a lot of those dimensions of ways of looking at them, their own selves, right? Their self-image and what they imagine to be. And when, when Narend was talking about the fourth industrial revolution, and I was thinking, is that, is there some other way for people from post-colonial countries to, to rise up and progress in ways that don't follow necessarily the path that the West has put for us or the path of the world? Can we develop some other path to our own progress that might meet our own needs, which, which might be different? So one of, the, one of the open educational practices, and I haven't actually had a slide to define open educational practices, but I'm just going to say this real quick over here. Sometimes open educational practices are defined by um, the use of open educational resources, the adaptation, the remixing, and so on, and the creation of them. But I think there are also open educational practices that are more about making use of the open web and focusing on the processes of how do we benefit from the open web to interact and communicate with each other, whether between uh, educators or between educators and students or among students. And so virtually connecting is actually one of those that does not use OER at all. Um, if I, I don't know how many people who are with us today have heard about virtually connecting. Maybe you can just type very quickly. So Suzanne is saying, Leo Haven says there are lots of definitions of OEP and the strength in, is in the differences between them. I agree. And I think it's quite, quite all right that there are different uh, understandings of it. And I think the understandings evolve as the technology and the society changes to keep up with the technology to make good use of it, right? So, so virtually connecting is something I co-founded. As someone from the Global South who is a woman who has a young child, it's quite difficult for me to travel to conferences and it was getting quite frustrating that I was missing out on that cultural capital, those social conversations, the social capital you develop in conferences with networking, right? I can't be part of those conversations. I don't mind missing the presentations themselves because a lot of times the slides are available online or the paper or book chapter you can find a lot of times open access. But the traveling to conferences, those social conversations from which a lot of project ideas come and, and collaboration, those don't usually happen in normally. So what virtually connecting is, is that we connect people who can't be at a conference with people at a conference and we sit for like half an hour, 45 minutes to have a chat with them. And that was definitely the first time I spoke to Lisa in a synchronous video conversation. Um, and so the intention of virtually connecting is obviously to, to, to make that difference. It's a social justice intention. Originally, for people with economic problems or social problems or, or health problems that do not allow them to go to conferences. But at the same time, these are still, you're still keeping conferences as something important. You're not, you're challenging academic gatekeeping in one form of, by the way, even though you're at the conference, we're still going to be able to talk to people who are there. You're still going to be able to be part of those conversations. But on the other hand, you're also saying, yeah, conferences are still important. We haven't decided that we're not important anymore. So the purpose is to address the economic aspect. The cultural and political aspects are a bit trickier because it's not always going to happen. So what we realized is virtually connecting can have a negative effect if we always invite the most high profile people to be our guests. And so we're sort of amplifying already powerful people and their voices. So it's a social reproduction of their power. But we can be careful and try to invite women and minorities and people of color and early career scholars to be our guests and then to have those voices um, become amplified as well. And then on the other side, the the people who attend uh, a virtually connecting session are often women, minorities, global south, early career scholars who, or graduate students who don't have funding. But if they're in this session and they're unable to have a proper conversation with the, the speakers, then maybe it's a neutral type of thing. It's as if it's broadcasting. So what we try to do is we try to sort of help them get used to speaking, encourage them to speak so that they have a voice in there. So that the presence of a minority person who's not at a conference 
goes back and influences the conference itself. And so you're sort of transforming the conference then. It's not just more broadcasting towards the minorities, but or towards the marginal groups, but it's going both ways. Um, and, and, and Sarah's saying sometimes people who are in the session who are on site enjoy the reflecting back with, with others, yeah, and they're benefiting as well. It's not just a give thing, it's a give and take thing happening. And so one of the things we've been talking about is intentionally equitable hospitality. And it is that you're being hospitable to people sitting in a room together, but you're not saying everyone is welcome and just assuming that people will be welcome just because you've told them they are welcome. It's about trying to keep in mind the needs of the marginalized people and try to be more, more hospitable to those mama. who have less access. Okay, so we were just today, Sarah and I, on Twitter talking about this article from this mm -hmm. website called Take Equity, where they were talking about those farthest away from justice. And that's who you need to work with on equity. So it's not about making something available to everyone. It's about can you make it available to those? I haven't heard you for the past oh, six no. minutes. Is it okay now? Oh no. Is it getting Raises, better? We might Any catch better? up over some of the lag, maybe. Am I still breaking up? I need to keep talking to know if I'm breaking up. Ooh. Okay. Please go back I'm, I'm going to uh, turn off uh, my camera. OK. I turned off my camera. Hopefully, yes. that will help. Let me know if it's helping. Um, so one of the things to keep in mind is, OK, so I was talking about intentionally equitable hospitality and that we need to address the needs of those farthest away from social justice. If the very farthest away from social justice for whom virtually connecting makes no difference is people who don't have internet at all. So if someone has no internet at all, they probably won't be able to participate in virtually connecting on a lot of open education because it's a lot of it is synchronous. So they would lose out on that, but the sessions are recorded and they could watch them later, but then the impact is neutral because they're watching, they're not participating. Right? Uh, but for people who can make it, some of the ways we try to be intentionally equitable to marginalized people, first of all, is that we try to invite guests that the remote participants are interested in, not the ones who are on site want to amplify, but the ones who cannot be there want to hear from. Uh, the other thing is to intentionally invite people who are minorities, both as guests and as participants. So. For example, when we see that someone notices virtually connecting is going on, we invite them specifically by name because minorities, a lot of times when you say everybody's welcome, don't realize that they are included in that everybody. They're used to not being welcome. Versus white men, they're, they always feel like they're welcome. They assume that you're inviting them when you say anybody, right? Um, and then other things we try to do when we're inside a session, when we try to make it possible for different people to type if they can't talk, to uh, to encourage the to make sure that, for example, that a white man dominating the conversation doesn't get that. So we can be hospitable, but we need to stop sometimes a white person or a white man from hogging a conversation, and that that is the way to be equitable, to make sure that everyone else has a chance to speak, um, and things like that. And and so and also we spend a lot of time with people who are early in their careers or or not used to this kind of space to try to get them used to it so that they're comfortable speaking, to explain to them what this is, to try to invite them several times in a row so that they become more comfortable with it. So that's one of the things we do. And still, we realize that not every session will be like that. And some of our uh, volunteers are better at this intentionally equitable hospitality than others, which is why we decided to give it a name and to write a paper on it so that we can help people be more intentional about what they're doing there. Because it's not something you're used to doing, probably outside of this context. Another thing, um, very quickly, I know I don't have a lot of time, 
very quickly, two things that I think can be used for social justice or not. So we often think about Wikipedia as a space that is democratic. Anybody can edit, but this really means those who can afford the time, those who have the digital literacies, even though it's actually quite easy now to edit Wikipedia. A few years ago, it, was, it needed markup language, I think. And then people will understand the standards for what counts as credible knowledge. And what counts as credible knowledge about biographies, for example, requires pretty hegemonic standards of what knowledge is. And so you know, a lot of minorities in the world and minority cultures don't have the documentation that counts as credible for Wikipedia. And therefore, it's quite difficult to get indigenous knowledge by indigenous people count on a place like Wikipedia. So who polices those standards? And the majority of editors are white male. And what does that mean for the kind of content that becomes uh, most, that exists more on Wikipedia or is fuller on Wikipedia? And so which knowledge has the priority? What's more prevalent? If you, if you speak more than one language, if you pick up a politically contested type of article, you'll see that the stories are quite different in the two languages. Uh, but obviously, people from, who speak one language will only see that language. They won't see the other side of the story because Wikipedia requires this consensus. Right? Uh, but there are ways to resist that. So there are feminist and local editathons and hackathons that focus on creating more material about women or more material that are local to particular countries. But the standards and processes are still there. So you're sort of maybe dealing with the cultural aspect by creating these, but the political, like who decides, will not happen until there are enough minorities and women who are leading in, in, you know, in, in all these spaces in Wikipedia. Even when the CEO or you know, the top person is a woman, but a lot of the people who are doing the actual work are not women, not minorities. The third thing I wanted to talk about is collaborative annotation. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. I mean, there are different tools, obviously, that allow for this. The one I use the most is called Hypothesis. And this has a lot of pedagogical value um, because digital annotation in itself has pedagogical value. Like if you ask your students to read an article and annotate it, and then annotating it collaboratively and openly has the advantage of people seeing each other's annotations, responding to each other, and talking to each other on the sentence and paragraph level of an article. So it has that pedagogical purpose. But in terms of social justice, there was Audrey Waters a few years ago talked about how she didn't want people to annotate her, her blog. And she put up some code to prevent that because she said, this is my space. And if people start you know, abusing me on this, on this space with hypothesis, she won't be able to remove that. So it was an added layer of something that she preferred to have removed. And ever since then, a lot of people have been more sensitive when they come to annotate something, they take permission from the person, even though they don't need to. So but th these are ways in which it could be negative. I, am, I once had a peer-reviewed article of mine being annotated, and I was worried about a particular troll who might have been starting to put re really negative comments, and it would be completely outside of my control. Um, but then this kind of space thing, you know, something like collaborative annotation, which I think is social justice-wise is mostly neutral can be used in a social justice orientation if in something like marginal syllabus, where, for example, they do one thing, which is um, pick articles that are about social justice or written by minorities and annotate those and announce those. So therefore, you're amplifying those voices. Um, and then the other thing would be they used to do it like in a one hour thing, and that was sort of time zone hegemonic. And then they said, no, we're, we're going to make it over like three days so that more people are able to participate. And therefore, you're, you're improving the, you know, the, the extent of diversity of people who can participate in something. So I think I'm almost done for time. And I just want to say, how can we rethink open educational practices, but honestly, any educational practice, so that they're able to address social justices in practice and taking in mind all of the different contexts for which our um, you know, our intervention, our innovation is going to apply. How do we ensure parity of participation of those who will be affected? How can we give them a voice and a space to participate on their own terms, not our, on our terms? So with virtually connecting, because I'm the co-founder, so there's already someone from the Global South who thinks a lot about these things, but we try as much as possible. Like most people who are with me, the person who co-founded it was a graduate student who was unaffiliated at the time. A lot of us are alt academics. A lot of us are unaffiliated, and all of these. And, and then we have uh, someone from Iran, Paris, and Iran, who has visa issues, so she can't go to many countries. Thank and the you, more Maha, we have people who are like that. Great uh, presentation gave us lots of insights. I particularly liked the uh, the comments about inter 
<clears throat> intentionally equitable hosp hospitality, something I hadn't heard before. A uh, couple of questions from the chat. Um, the first is from Suzanne. Uh, but do you bring the conference experience in re reference to virtual connecting, virtually connecting, uh, do you bring the conference experience to those who cannot be there, or does it become something else? I think you kind of answered that in your presentation, but maybe you would like to expand on that. Yeah, and Suzanne actually knows. Suzanne, Suzanne actually knows because she's, one, she's been one of us. But I think it's an important thing to say. I think we ended up creating something different and parallel. To conferences I think you're right it's not so much it used to be that we wanted to bring the conference experience to people but it became this other thing that happens at conferences parallel to the conferences okay. I think you're right and I also had a question I recently finished reading Robin DeAngelo's white fragility book um, and um, and I'm just wondering mm -hmm. how can we become more aware uh, of when we aren't addressing the root causes of injustice and and how do we deal with white fragility because that's definitely an issue when I think about the book burnings that are happening in the United States right. and the protests about mm -hmm. whiteness. Okay, so, so this, is, this is obviously a big <laughs> question to ask me, but I, I'm going to try. I think one of the, one of the key things um, is to, first of all, surround yourself by people who are different from you, who are minorities, and to have lots of each kind of minority. So I didn't understand, I'm in the context where homosexuality is not something I deal with every day. I didn't start to become empathetic to, to, for example, the issues related to homosexuality until I had about five homosexual close friends who I was talking to on a regular basis, not talking to them about their homosexuality. It's just they've become part of my social circle that I talk to all the time. And it just became more natural for me to sort of understand that. And, and the really important thing is to listen because it's very difficult to listen to viewpoints that are different from your own, especially if they will actually make you uh, part of a villainhood, right? And you need to understand it's not about you personally, but as a white person or whatever, but that that it's 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 uh, it's a general thing, that it's a systemic thing, right? And to be aware of the different layers of it at the systemic level or the micro level, so things like microaggression. If someone trusts you, they'll talk to you about them, but it's not something that a minority will always talk about explicitly with someone else. The other thing, though, I think is that um, a lot of uh, minorities or marginals, marginalized people will, there, there are two ways they would express dissent. One of them will be very aggressive and it's difficult to listen to, but you need to try to listen to it. The other way is to try to sort of uh, talk about it gently so that they get listened to, but if you don't listen closely enough, you'll miss out the criticism there. So <laughs> it's sort of a balance of, of trying to, to both listen carefully, even when it makes you angry or upset or hurt. So that's the addressing the white fragility part, I guess. And the other one is when you doesn't hurt, you need to look very closely to try to understand what it is they're actually trying to say sometimes. I don't think that really answers your question. I'm, I'm familiar with Robin, Robin DeAngelo's work but I haven't actually read that book, so I should probably Excellent read it book. as well. Excellent book. Okay, we're going to move on to our final speaker today, who is Sarah Lambert, and she'll be talking about open education on the road to social justice. Um, Sarah is from Deakin University in Australia, and thank you, Sarah, for being with us at this very late hour in Australia. She manages a $5 million, uh, $5 million program of student equity projects and services, including equity innovation grants for the benefit of future and current socioeconomically disadvantaged learners at Deakin University. Previously, she managed open education programs and partnerships after a career in technology-enhanced learning, including executive member of the Austra, Australasian um, Council for Online and, and E-Learning, ACODE. And she is a board member at Horizon AU Report. A proud feminist, equity ally, and first in family member to go to university, Sarah's recent research explores um, how online education programs can be reconceptualized as social justice actions to widen education participation for underrepresented uh, learners and communities. She's currently the chief investigator on a national scoping study of open educational textbooks as social justice in the Australian context and is co-editing a social justice themed special edition of JIME with Laura Chernowitz from the University of Cape Town, um, an issue that I, for one, am very much looking forward to reading when it is published. So um, please go ahead, Sarah. 
that introduction and uh, Maha and Naren for your presentations and I have been um, really enjoying getting into the, the vibe and um, it's, it's interesting we've started off talking about open education with a, a view of open universities and ODL and, and Maha's brought in some really practical um, social justice actions in terms of our open practices and I think so I'm, I'm going to finish up talking about courses, um, op open educational courses, resources and, and MOOCs um, about which I'm, in my recent research has been focused and so that will be um, the land in which we dwell for the, the next little while. And so um, I, I <sighs> Recently, in response to a question from um, esteemed European researcher Aris Boskert about what needs updating in open education, uh, I said I think there's been a critical turn in open education and that ideas of social justice and decolonisation for student and social benefit have refreshed what we mean when we talk about democratisation of knowledge in open education. And I think for a good while there, um, democratisation of knowledge was primarily thought about in terms of putting free stuff online for everybody. And in particular, putting free high status university stuff online for the rest of us who were missing out. And I, I used to think that too. And I even put some free Australian higher education stuff online for everybody at one time. But actually, uh, my colleagues and I were working in a regional university with strong links to the community. and so. Um, we instinctually did something a bit different to the big brand MOOCs, but um, I might return to that later if we have time. So I think what um, Maha has given us with her definitions of social justice and Fraser and what the implications are for, for um, decolonisation are really, really timely and there's definitely been a conversation happening um, globally around this, which is, which is really interesting because when I first began working in this area, it just... Uh, it was really not possible to talk about those things and the, the, um, the conversation about putting things, free things online for all was just uh, such a huge discourse and um, it has definitely changed. So within this critical turn, if I, if I pick a couple of key timelines and I am talking particularly, I, I think about this digital chapter of open education. If we look at 2002, that first UNESCO OER announcement and, and definition, and it has a phrase in the text by and for the, the developing world. And I think in the light again of what we've heard from both Narend and, and Maha, this is important powerful social justice words, but those were not the words that ever really got cited in that, in that critical text. Um, I think if we jump forward to the yellow bubble to 2012 when the Paris OER declaration came out, it was a kind of a little bit, a little bit more look, um, not, not much has changed here. I'm getting a bit impatient. We, we really need to be doing this social justice OER. Uh, and it's quite a, a strong social justice based um, text there. But again, that, that component of it that talks about giving a little more to those who have less, those who are further from justice, as um, Maha said, that again didn't much get cited. And in the middle in particular, the Cape Town Open Ed Declaration was very technology forward and innovation focused. And so this is a, a space where there was a, a lot of uh, hopeful going on. But if we wind forward to 2019 and 20, there's definitely been a reality check, um, a real assessment of the evidence, um, a sense that you can't keep talking up uh, the potential of something, um, what is really holding us back and, and maybe um, we need to rethink and take stock. And, I think in this last window too, there's been an increase in global inequalities and that really sharpens people's focus. You know, certainly in Australia, we have increased homelessness and um, people on the streets and it's something you wouldn't think we'd have, but we've had a lot of it and um, we've had a lot of defunding and it, it's, it's really uh, in education, in social services, it's, um, you know, it makes uh, educators sit up and think, you know, what are we doing this all for? So there's definitely been a shift. But in this middle patch here, there was uh, what I call the MOOC mayhem, <laughs> the promises and the over-optimism and the uh, we will have education for all and, uh, and, you know, shortly thereafter world peace. And it seems a bit crazy uh, from the perspective of now, but it was a big thing, right? It was, it was um, enormously optimistic time and, um, 
and then I think if you see the little bubbles underneath, there was a, a lot of frustration as that did not rapidly emerge at all and, and um, indeed some very different things happened. And I also just acknowledge that uh, you know while, while there was this kind of hype and then a, a crash happening in some parts of the world, other parts of the world were just getting on with it and um, not perhaps making the Western media, that's for sure, and, and still today sitting from the perspective of Australia, which is very close to Asia, you know, I, each MOOC event I go to that talks about what's happening here with digital credentials and international you know, accreditation and so on, I, I still no one talks about the Swayam platform or the Chinese platform. There's the huge numbers of learners that we could be linking to if they even wanted to. But um, you know, there's a, an under talking about some of these major developmental uses of MOOCs that um, don't hit the mainstream media. But but that's starting to become um, more talked about. And this this notion of you know we want more regional responses, we want localised responses, um, we don't want a colonial knowledgeing has definitely, definitely changed. So I think it's um, a much more real time and a much more in some ways positive time as we are starting to get a feel for, for some things that will work and what really doesn't that we uh, ought to give up on. <laughs> so that's not a bad thing in my opinion. Ah oh dear, I'm having a slide crash here. There's um. A quote has just been wiped out by the wonders of technology. <laughs> but um, yes, so I think there was a, before this, this period of emancipation, so openness will emancipate learners, you know, there will be change. But I write in a paper um, that I think that's a, a red herring and we were definitely caught up in um, what Penny Jane Burke refers to as a regime of truth where the stories we tell each other just keep perpetuating about what openness can do and what openness can change. And I think um, after a while um, it really it becomes um, an echo uh, that, that um, many of us can't believe and so the critical voices begin to question, you know, the potential, where, where does, when is the rubber going to hit the road? And so, um, you know, in terms of MOOCs as a case study there, um, oh, I'm afraid to say some of my slide graphics are crashing here, but um, I'm going to pull up my own version locally and at least read you the, the figures here. So, um, so the, in terms of this openness, addiction to openness and putting free things online in that MOOC mayhem phase, what happened is we invested in the already educated and the relatively privileged. And um, I crunched some numbers recently to really um, to really look at how much we did that, you know, with our uh, openness rhetoric. And um, so basically, we had about thirty-four thousand MOOCs made between twenty fourteen and twenty eighteen. And then, if we take a number out of the sort of average development cost in the paper from Hollands and Tatali, then if we say 100k per MOOC, then we're looking at uh, 3.4 billion dollars invested in the already educated and the relatively privileged. And that was not what we said we wanted to do. And it's the opposite of that economic forms of justice and redistribution to um, funnel that much extra investment which was really come about on that at least partially on a rhetoric of education for all and we ended up with um, a, a massive investment in the already educated. So so this um, has made me reflect a lot and um, has been in some ways what stimulated my own um, research in the last few years because I really wanted to understand how we could have uh, hoped so much and, and then did so little in that particular period of time and what we can learn about that. And um, one of the things that I that I reflect on from that time, because I myself was very hopeful as an education technology practitioner, I wanted to believe that, that um, openness would do that. And I was working from a regional university where widening participation for regional students was a real real need. And I think in Australia there's a great difference between what happens in our metropolitan big cities and what happens in the rest of the country. I, I feel this is similar in some ways to Europe but I'd be really happy to have some clarification from the participants as clearly that's not my space. Um, but um, I think that um, 
this notion of hope, you know, of, of hoping for things. Um, there was a kind of aspirational regime of truth, to, to use Penny Jane Burke's there, the stories we tell ourselves, so, so um, about that power of openness. But to place one's hope in an undefined openness is, I, I've reflected, I think it's futile as Freire's, what Freire talks about as raw hope. And that, uh, he says, is the hoped for is not attained by dint of raw hoping. <laughs> Just to hope is to hope in vain. And what we have to do is um, act intentionally. And so I think some of those words that Maha used about the intentionality um, comes into play here. Because what, what we really need to do is we need to uh, augment our hope and, and our critical understanding that this uh, putting things online free for everyone, this sort of free being an economic redistributive moment, you would think, you know, people who have less, we give them free things. It sort of logically feels like it should do a lot. But um, that free stuff drifted upwards to the uh, already advantaged on the whole in that early phase of MOOCs in any case. So we critique, but we still have our hope, but we need to act on our hope. And so what Freire talks about is this critical praxis between hoping and the critical imperative and then acting. And so using what you find in your critique to, to drive action further and that produces the change. And for someone who's, you know, really struggling as I think we are with inequality globally, I hang on to this um, and remind myself that we can, each of us in our different locations, I think, use the tools that we have to, to be more intentional. And as Maha's talked about that with intentionality about who we address in our virtually connecting, I'm talking about the deliberate design. So the, the design for justice for those who are experiencing injustice. And, and that means you need to understand really who is, is experiencing that injustice in your local area. In, in, in our place, it's often the regional learners are absolutely um, experiencing uh, greater injustice. And so this is where um, I posited from theory a new, de a new definition for open education, wanting to bring it back to that 2002 and 2012 hoped for um, place of open education being an actual uh, social justice act, being part of widening participation. And so the um, the definition that I proposed was based on Fraser's three principles of social justice that Maha really succinctly nailed. So I'm barely going to touch it at all <laughs> because that was such a great description. But the redistributive as a principle of, of uh, giving back the economic, um, overcoming some economic injustice. The recognitive, that recognition, the justice in recognising identity and different cultures and different languages. So recognitive justice. Representational justice is that um, having voice to speak, that, that political, you know, not only to speak but to be heard and to be effective in that space. Space. And, and all of that together is, is really needed to address the social uh, and educational history of exclusion. And so once we think about those three different principles, it makes us think more clearly about how we can address each of those slightly differently in the work that we do to produce courses. It sort of gives you a bit more of a laser-like focus rather than thinking of just the free stuff. It's like, what else can we do? You know, what how can we make that, uh, how can we recognise the learners? How can the learners see themselves in the materials we produce? Um, and that would be a, a great place to start. And so um, again, with gratitude to Maha for um, this translation, um, which was a lovely moment for me. But the, the definition here I'm suggesting is open education. It is the development of free digitally enabled learning materials and experiences primarily by and for the benefit and empowerment of non-privileged learners who may be underrepresented in education systems or marginalised in their global context. So, you know, for people in Europe, you know, all of the countries in Europe are not equally powerful, are not equally developed, are not equally um, status, are not equally resourced, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot going on there and the same, you know, within the states of Australia would be the same. So thinking more locally about who is in need of that I think is um, some powerful ways of thinking rather than thinking of everyone as if we are all somehow magically equal. Um, and so to return to this um, Freire and his pedagogy of hope and, and how can we can we in these difficult times when we have gone through, you know, economic 
um, turmoil and the global financial crisis is not that long and this, the ripples are still moving through in Europe and in fact that's, um, uh, you know, we felt it in many parts of the world. But we're wanting to help overcome that with our open education. We want to hang on to our hope. We want to be hopeful, but we don't want to be hopeless <laughs> either with, with our actions. So, so I guess what I'm suggesting is um, particularly in this educational, higher education space, hope needs evidence. And this is what again drove me to undertake a, a study, um, a, a major systematic review of, of MOOCs. And I asked, do MOOCs contribute to student equity and social inclusion? Uh, and undertook that systematic review and it's, it's um, published in Com Computers and Education very recently after a long, long period of review, I'm happy to say, and um, it is gold open access. So I wanted to just touch on some of these um, hopeful moments um, because they suggest that um, social justice oriented educators, institutions have continued to invest in, in MOOCs to do exactly these kinds of social inclusion and student equity moves all around the world, including in Europe, I think um, funded often through the Erasmus projects and, and in response to the GFC and again dealing with regional um, and inter sort of regional um, socioeconomic disadvantage and needing to upskill and um, get up with technology and letting that try and to, to build um, economies moving forward. And so um, I did a graphical abstract. They said I should. I did. There it is. I don't know. Was it time well spelled? I'm not sure. But <laughs> um, the map on the left just suggests that the systematic review studies um, were, you know, reasonably well distributed globally. Um, it was not as skewed towards North America and uh, Northern Europe as many EdTech studies. There was uh, just over 50% in other parts of the world, including in both North and South of Europe, which is great. Um, in fact, 17% of the studies were from Europe there, policy as well as um, practice types of reports. And um, the MOOCs there, they're talking about definitely free online resources, but also face-to-face -face study groups or additional forms of support, some at in distance mode and some in blended mode. We're talking about learners with low skills, low confidence, low levels of previous education, but aspiration by the bucket load and, and uh, strengths and determination and resilience. And, um, and that's often how we talk of learners in this widening participation research spaces is, is the strengths that they have that we can leverage. And uh, when your, your road to education has been bumpy, um, we tend to find students um, have a lot of grit and a lot of motivation so um, and a lot of resistance too to um, what has you know the, the difficulties and uh, I think what um, Yosso talks about as resistance capital is something I feel personally <laughs> when um, you know my path has been rocky I, I tend to be a pusher back rather than a <laughs> and that that can help in an educational space as well in, in terms of advocacy but there's other forms of capitals not just cultural and that's um I do like that about Yosso's work. Experience capital is another one. Um, any case, I won't get into the um, into the figures there. Um, it's sort of in the abstract of the paper, but th there were definitely open technologies there, but proprietary technologies too. It really didn't matter the status, the legal status of the platform or the resources. It was the intentionality of what people wanted to do with it. If they wanted to enable particular sets of uh, disadvantaged learners, then they could turn their mind to, to what that really would look like. Um, it also identified some gaps. Um, I was, uh, I guess, a bit disappointed that with um, the MOOCs topics doing so much in the, um, the the IT and the tech area and the STEM area, that um, even in the studies that uh, I reviewed that, that seemed to have some interest in in equity um, did never track the progress of women in those courses and you know women in STEM underrepresentation is just a global phenomenon so there's a, there's a challenge for researchers of any um, STEM MOOC to, um, to at least have a look and then if we see what is happening there, uh, there might be some motivation to, uh, to address that underrepresentation and what it means. So being a bit provocative here but you know don't reuse um, the reuse, the, the, the rhetoric of reuse being a success factor we've, we've had for a long time. I think there's a number of voices questioning if that um, is really the, um, 
the magical component in OER content. It can be um, risk. It can be risky in terms of that colonial reusing from one context into one that doesn't make sense. Of course, it doesn't have to be. I'm being a bit provocative. You, re re reusing in, within the context can might be handy and save someone time, but there's just not a lot of evidence that that actually happens a great deal. Um, so in my studies, the ones that succeeded, they designed from scratch with particular learners and their needs in mind. And that's this cognitive justice piece of recognising what is needed that is particular and local. Um, I see you. I see who you are. I see what you need. And we, we can you know, design for that rather than the mysterious anybody. And designing with representat representatives of the actual learner community, that representational justice piece with learners can or learner representatives of the community that are trying to be enabled are actually participating in, in the development of, of those programs and or sometimes the support of them as well. And I think that was, um, um, it was uh, less prevalent but certainly um, effective when it happened. So I find, um, I found a great deal of hope <laughs> from, um, from what was happening in the study. The other thing that emerged as well is the power of community partnership in the MOOC and the ODL space. So rather than thinking about just your technology partnerships and your technology platforms, who are you partnering with in your community who have that outreach, who have the connections, who understand the context and, and development um, of many of the successful um, MOOC cases, uh, some in distance mode, some in blended mode, often had a community partner. and. So getting into that recognition of what the community needs, that recognitive justice piece was happening practically in the context of an existing community partnership. And then I think from that recognitive justice start point, that would often be the beginning of a, of a iterative development cycle that would lead to a more representational justice where those community members were actually more active in the course development. And it makes sense. If you get to know a community, you see their strength, you see their skills, you know, that you see, you know, want to, in, you want to engage them. So the move from recognitive to representational justice through community partners was, was something of interest um, that I thought had um, some potential as well. And I think within that move, it often allowed for a more sustainable MOOC model. So uh, the use of community partners for the support component um, can help with the sustainability. So um, I, f I found those and, and I hope, um, you know, I'd love to hear if anybody has had a crack at any of these things in the comments. It would be great to hear if there's more recent local examples. And so, um, so I, I, I found that whole experience very hopeful and, um, and I found the study, the study sort of suggests that we should not consider MOOCs are dead and indeed the numbers of institutions who are signing up are still grows, which is, um, which is amazing. And not all of them want to be, you know, making money off postgraduate micro-credentials. Um, many do, but <laughs> not all of them. So I, I think that I think that this suggests that there is a viable practice of using MOOCs as a widening participation and a social justice action to various degrees that the principals are engaged, but the free component is the economic and then this recognitive and representational I've discussed in the way that the communities are involved. Um, I, there's one in particular that um, a study that I'm, I actually have open in a window behind me. It's in a Roddle paper from um, uh, Jean-Francois Colas, um, Peter Slope and Muriel Garita Domingo. So a great European example. Um, I'm going to post the, um, the direct link in the chat in just a minute. But this was a, a study on the effect of multilingual facilitation on active participation in MOOCs. And they had, um, they dealt with different language groupings in the online and they had uh, synchronous and asynchronous um, mother tongue language conversations around the English content and, and it's just a fascinating study of recognising uh, the learners language and culture and um, helping them bridge um, into difficult new learning material for teacher training of ICT in different regions of, of Europe. So um, I found that one uh, particularly fascinating, and it was certainly uh, the first time I'd, I'd, I'd heard of this um, 
multilingual facilitation and, and also a schools network was part of this so the community partnership backdrop was also part of that process so there's a bunch of school teachers in in partner schools who were offered this program and and that suggests that you're going to have actual physical groups of teachers signing up probably in the same schools so there's a kind of possible layer of community local face-to-face -face chats happening with the teachers in their local schools then you've got a virtual network of, of uh, same language um, teachers talking together as well as the bigger cohort so quite a fascinating uh, design so um, so just to finish up um, it was so fascinating that systematic review study and all of the amazing examples that it that it you know brought forth that I've gone on to do some additional work synthesizing um, synthesizing out a conceptual model so I'm, I've got another paper in review that leap, leaps off that data again and, and synthesizes qualitatively a six critical dimensions model of open and online education and um, that little that little picture there is, is sort of suggesting that inclusion and equity can be at the heart of your your cohort and that there can be skills and materials and purpose and autonomy and support and um, that study is um, as I said so I hope to get that paper out soon and, and get some feedback on that and see if it might also spread to other contexts but what I did find in undertaking that study looking at the role of technology in particular was that it was not enabling it, it allowed people to get started of course the free technology but it did not assure their progress or success in any way but what that technology did was grow or amplify the other dimensions and by focusing on technology design as an amplification for those other dimensions I think we again foreground the inclusion foreground the equity foreground what it is that is particular and local and needed and um, again I've found great hope in that and I, I hope that others will also um, find hope in it similarly with our GIME uh, open education and social justice special edition really so excited to see new writers writing from different regional locations um, talking about their widening participation in social justice initiatives so um, bringing those vo voices forward in a publishing formal sense I think I'm really um, keen to if you like correct the the record the academic record of what open education is is possible of away from an entirely sort of technocentric um, and innovations rhetoric not entirely of course I'm, I'm overstating but there's a strong um, dominance of that into a um, this critical turn of, of open education for which there are many people in open education uh, open universities um, in the north and the south and so it's not for me this is not just a global south moment but in the regions of the north where there is inequality between you know main centers is, is still uh, I think um, a powerful driving need for us to come to grips with these kinds of principles and elevate what is possible for us to do when we design with intention and I think that will be enough from me Thank you, Sarah. Uh, you said you wanted to be provocative, and I think if you look through the discussions that are happening within the chat area, I think you'll find out that they have generated a great deal of discussion, a great deal of interaction amongst the participants. So, the, uh, so you have been provocative. <laughs> I look forward to there looking are, back. Are, mm. <laughs> there are a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is from Suzanne, but I'm, I'm not sure if it's more of a rhetorical question. Uh, where she asks about developing world uh, is this development according to what and to whom um, Sarah or Suzanne maybe uh, maybe you could write something in the chat about whether whether that was a question you want Sarah to address um, I, I do have a question that is directed to you specifically Sarah yep. um, from Franz Josef who has said you mentioned open and proprietary technologies do you think open source technologies are more have more potential to address open learning uh, because if we want to spread open learning widely a cost factor factor has to be kept in mind as well uh, I have um, a kind of I think open source um, technology there's certainly open platforms we're very grateful to have and I think can make a difference um, but 
but again, how they're used. If they're used intentionally, and we invest in those intentionally, and we can we can use them for these sorts of forms of recognitive justice, I think I think we can we can go somewhere. But of themselves, you know, open source platforms are somewhat prone to um, to the white IT guy um, moment, and in fact, there has been a massive um, uh, um, a sort of conversation happening around around open science and open data and open source with um, with uh, large numbers of of women actually really having had enough of of, of some pretty poor misogynist kinds of behaviour in the communities that actually develop the open source softwares. And so I think that there's, that's been critiqued for, for um, many years, both academically and practically, and, and clearly hasn't been addressed. So I think that we have to be very careful um, with suggesting that open source communities are a safe place. And if we can't make those safe, I think then they're, they're not really going to be a great solution to scale up if we're basically scaling up um, unsafe spaces for, for lots of people. So it's also not going to generate the best work, right? It's not going to generate the contributors um, providing their diversity and their best work and all their great problem solving. So it's actually going to also hold back ultimately what open source can do um, and the whole innovation project. So I think it's, it's um, I think we need to avoid a simplistic um, open equals great in all Parts of open education, including open source, but um, as I, but if we can take on, for example, there's some fantastic inclusive um, education guides, inclusive principles. There's inclusive event guides coming out. You know, if some of the open source communities could embed those in their codes of conduct and start to actually, you know, walk that talk, I think that those platforms would strengthen, attract a, a, such a greater and more diverse set, set of voluntary actions of people who wanted to be there and do great things with them. So, so I think it just, uh, I think we just need to take a, um, a reality check and, and address that issue before we, uh, we kind of thrust that um, as a solution. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Um, I have a question for all of the panel members. We don't have much time left, so um, I'd just like to, you to each perhaps to address this question. Um, in terms of the European context, why do you believe the issue of social justice is, is an important one for Europe? So can I just start very quickly? Because I think maybe because we're all from the Global South, a lot of what we were talking about was social justice across borders, but within any one country, if we, if we look at the intersectionality of the population, there will always be people who are of a different socioeconomic situation. There will always be gender differences. Of course, the differences in gender differ in different contexts. But there will always be minorities. There will be immigrants. There will be people with disabilities. So there will always be, in every context, your own minority groups and within each country who they are and how much different they are from each other will differ. And you need to look at the combinations of things. So the immigrant woman versus, uh, you know, all those kinds of differences that you look at. There will always be people to consider that are different. The, the and the regional population. and the underemployed, you know, these are huge numbers of people. And, um, and I think that, um, you know, if we if we don't listen to those areas, then you know again we lose cultural richness. There's issues of of language and culture in Europe dying out in parts, which I think is really sad. And and again, there's that loss of tradition and and strength. You know, um, the indigenous knowledges. You know how how you might define that that traditional knowledge base. That you know if we don't if we don't um, capture and and start taking that on board. Again, we lose out overall. You know, again, there's a sort of a net loss. So, um, whether or not you you want to take a an ethical view that we should do it for the people who are excluded, which we should, but also we all benefit when when people can make a full contribution with their um, diverse cultural backgrounds. So, I think there's a um, a win-win uh, when when we really include. Um, all of our regional, cultural, subcultural, um, multicultural layers of which you know Europe has many. Okay, Naren, did you want to add? 
But if I may come in and make uh, two points. Um, so the first is historical. Um, much of the global south has been colonized in the past, and we are still many decades later uh, dealing with the vestiges of colonialism and the pernicious effects on uh, the colonized nations. And uh, given the inequalities and the poverty and the, and the conditions which prevail, the lack of resources and so on, because most of the resources of the uh, global south have been plundered during the colonial era. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, sort of evidence for that and, uh, you know, how the uh, distribution of uh, economic, uh, of wealth and of economic opportunity shifted uh, and changed dramatically during the colonial era. So there is a moral, I think a moral argument to be made that you cannot ignore uh, the challenges and the problems of the global south. But I think that for the future, there's another kind of argument, and that is uh, with the growing, with growing population, uh, with growing population worldwide, and the interdependencies we have, uh, it, it's one world, uh, it's not divided with the global north that has a closeted, protected uh, space in which it can thrive, while the rest of the world can be left to its own devices. Uh, because uh, the degradation of the planet in particular, and uh, water resources of uh, the soil and so on, uh, has an impact for everybody. You know, uh, and it's, it, it's going to impact on all of us. So I think it's in everyone's interest that we uplift the global south and bring them to benefit from the advances in technology and all of the, the goods of the, the various industrial revolutions and so on. So that every, when everyone is prosperous, or at least reasonably prosperous, has the basic amenities of life. They are not degrading the environment through ignorance, not degrading the environment uh, and, uh, you know, uh, mortgaging our future just because of the lack of opportunity and lack of uh, resources. So therefore, it's in everyone's interest, in my view, uh, that we do right for everybody help uplift everybody so everyone can prosper and we have a yes, sustainable future. Yes, absolutely. Yes. That's the big mm -hmm. challenge. Um, Anna Christina has one question, and I know we're over the time, uh, but I'd like to throw it out to you. Um, perhaps you can give a brief answer to this question if, if there's time. Um, in speaking of the Global South and including social, and including social inclusion, not exclusion not only from the physical south on the map and culture, would that be considered as cultural appropriation? Um, cultural appropriation is a particular thing um, and this is where uh, representative justice can help avoid that risk. So this is um, you know, white people writing black histories is, is not a great thing. Um, so, you know, I think we're past that moment. And so moving on to, um, you know, giving black people a space to tell black history, you know, that's the representative piece for sure. I think in the recognitive piece, um, what I'm writing about and the, the Losses that I'm that are informing me are talking about recognizing the strengths in in, in people who are different, rather than just recognizing and pointing out that they're different, and then you know wanting to you know as you say use their stuff for example you know take on their culture and so on that that's that's um, not the good stuff. But if you can think of recognitive justice more in terms of recognizing the strengths that um, learners have with their different backgrounds, I think that's a more positive interpretation, and it doesn't imply that you're going to be culturally appropriate appropriating um, their knowledge at, at all. I, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't merge those two, two ideas together, I suppose. And this is you know, one of the um, uh, difficulties of doing a short presentation without lots of academic <laughs> links and, and um, uh, definitions is, is we scoot over some of those differences there. But I think in the writings, and uh, it, it is clearer. 
Narend Maha, did you want to add to anything that Sarah said? No, I have I have no response no, sorry, that much as it's an important question. It's definitely uh -huh. important in the First Nations space, absolutely, and a huge conversation happening in Australia at, at, at this minute, but um, I'm not sure, uh, Canada as well, but uh, I'm not sure in other parts of the world. But yeah, we don't want to speak and uh, on behalf of, of, of others if we can, if we can just step back and let them speak instead. But you have to know that that's a thing, right? You have to name it. Naming that as a thing that you can do helps you <laughs> helps you do it, <laughs> and that's why I, I love those three principles. I suppose as a, as a way of helping change thinking and conversation. It's not the end. There's other things to do, but I just find it a useful thinking and therefore acting tool. Okay. I. Yeah, if I may come in, I, I don't think it's useful. If I may, Lisa, I don't think it's useful to silence any voice, especially uh, any voice that can be an advocate yes. or an activist. I think we require all of the critical voices. So if we are, if we become exclus exclusionist, or if we become, you know, begin to uh, define people in into and out of communities and voices, yeah. you know, we, we may just be doing ourselves a disservice. So for me, uh, it's more important that anyone who has an insight into the issues, whether it's theoretical or in, from the practical experiences and so on, I think that the more voices we can bring to the debate uh, and to uh, propose solutions, the better. For me, that uh, makes the... Yes, I think, though, I think there's a really better. nice value in, in making a difference between representatives and allies. Um, and I think that can be quite powerful um, to 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 name yourself like for myself as a white woman as an ally of people who are of color. You know, I, I'm not going <laughs> to speak for them, but I will back them and give them space. And so that's an ally role. And um, um, I think that's a useful distinction. But yeah, contribution. All of these contributions make a difference. Um, they are just different. Mm. Yeah, I like that. I like well, we've come to the end of a very insightful, very engaging, um, very eye-opening, I think, uh, webinar today. I want to thank all of our participants. I, uh, most especially, I want to thank our presenters um, for your wonderful presentations today, which will be made available on the Eden website. Um, so thank you very much, and a big round of applause for our presenters, and especially for Sarah, who is here late into the night uh, to participate. Um, and I just want to say once again, this topic I think is very relevant to us within online and distance um, and e-learning, um, open and distance e-learning, as, as, because we have an ongoing quest to continue and to ensure that ODEL continues to be accessible and available to all. Uh, and I think our presenters today have really given us um, the knowledge, the insight, the examples that that we can take back to our institutions and to our classrooms, um, in in a good in a good way to help make this happen. So thank you again for everything that you've done. Um, and as I said, the webinar recordings will be made available on the Eden website. Um, and one last point: our annual conference, our Eden annual conference, will be held next year in Timisoara, uh, Timisoara, Romania, um, from the 21st to the 21st. 24th of June, and we hope that you can all come. So thank you very much. And thank you to the Eden moderators, too, for helping make this, make this webinar successful. Thank you very much for your support, um, both thank on the front so. and, and the technical, and, and for also the goodwill of all the presenters in our collaborating. It's been a really positive experience, and um, thank you again.